Massive rotator cuff tears pose a complex and challenging problem for reconstructive shoulder surgeons. These tears are often complicated by poor tendon quality for repair, tendon scarring and retraction, and muscular atrophy and fatty infiltration. These characteristics have led to a re-tear risk that is much higher than reported for less severe rotator cuff tears. For these reasons, multiple treatment options have been proposed to manage these challenging problems. Compounding the treatment complexity is the considerable heterogeneity of the patient goals, desired activity levels, and tear characteristics. Debridement with biceps tenotomy or tenodesis has been reported to provide satisfactory short-term pain relief, but is primarily indicated for lower demand older patients. Partial rotator cuff repair is also reported to provide good outcomes when residual rotator cuff tissue is robust and can improve pain and function even if the entire rotator cuff cannot be repaired. When force couples are stabilized, significant improvement of active elevation can be achieved. More recently, tissue augmentation scaffolds are being investigated primarily to augment rotator cuff repairs where tension or tissue quality is considered suboptimal. This is primarily considered when rotator cuff tissues can be reapproximated, but reinforcement of the repair may minimize retear. Early results indicate improved function and that graft incorporation may occur. However, data describing reversal of fatty atrophy is less encouraging. Tendon transfer, such as the latissimus dorsi transfer, is a surgical option for patients with massive posterior superior tears and when the patient's primary symptoms are weakness, pain, and impaired active motion. Frequently, patients with demanding occupations are also excellent candidates for tendon transfers and can typically expect to improve one muscular grade. Finally, patients with glenohumeral arthrosis or older patients with significant active motion limitations may be excellent candidates for reverse shoulder arthroplasty. In this group of patients, functional improvements can be dramatic. However, long-term results and results in younger patients have yet to be fully defined. The indications for latissimus dorsi transfer are massive, irreparable, posterior superior rotator cuff tears in younger patients with minimal glenohumeral arthrosis. Patients with residual active motion above the shoulder level, pain due to active acromial impingement, and mild weakness tend to show considerable benefit after a latissimus dorsi transfer. Subscapularis or deltoid deficiency and advanced glenohumeral arthrosis are relative contraindications to this procedure. In this video, we illustrate a latissimus dorsi transfer in a 54-year-old male laborer who presented with pain and weakness with overhead activities. The procedure is performed in the beach chair position with use of Achilles allograft augmentation of the latissimus dorsi tendon. Preoperative physical examination demonstrates decreased forward flexion and abduction of the left shoulder. Note the asymmetry in these motion planes and the abnormal scapular thoracic motion. This generally occurs when the humeral head begins impinging on the undersurface of the acromion, likely due to the inability of the rotator cuff to completely prevent acromial impingement secondary to the complete loss of the supra and infraspinatus musculature. This muscular atrophy is apparent clinically by noting the significant atrophy of the supra and infraspinatus fossa as illustrated here. Internal rotation is similar bilaterally and indicates the subscapularis is functioning well. No external rotation lag is apparent with the arm adducted, and the horn blower sign is normal at 90 degrees of abduction, thereby indicating an intact teres minor. Abduction strength is quite weak, confirming his primary complaint. The patient is positioned in the modified beach chair position using a pneumatic shoulder positioning system. A range of motion is performed to confirm access to the latissimus dorsi harvest site. A standard preparation and draping is performed and the arm is covered using an occlusive dressing. Standard posterior and anterior arthroscopic portals are made and a diagnostic arthroscopy is performed to confirm the magnitude of the rotator cuff damage and to ensure that the tendon is truly irreparable. We perform the latissimus dorsi transfer in the beach chair position through two incisions. The first is made roughly at a 45 degree angle to the lateral border of the acromion and centered over the anterior lateral angle of the acromion. This is functionally positioned over the anterior deltoid refae. The skin is marked and incision is made. This is carried sharply to the level of the deltoid fascia. Two Gelpi retractors are placed and an electrocautery device is used to establish hemostasis and elevate the deltoid attachment to the acromion subperiosteli in both an anterior and posterior direction. 
The deltoid is split along its anterior rafe in line with its muscular fibers. Care should be taken distally as the axillary nerve can be encountered. As can be seen here, this approach provides excellent visualization of the greater tuberosity. A Gerber retractor can be placed to visualize the glenohumeral articulation and the posterior and anterior rotator cuff remnants. The supra and infraspinatus footprint are prepared using an arthroscopic burr to provide a healthy bleeding bed for later latissimus dorsi attachment. The remnant of the teres minor is tagged for later reattachment to the tendon transfer with non-absorbable suture. Next, a switching stick is used to estimate the appropriate location for the apex of the latissimus dorsi harvest incision. The switching stick is passed superficial to the teres minor and deep to the posterior deltoid. It is localized posteriorly and marked. This represents the angle of the posterior latissimus dorsi harvest incision. The arm is next abducted as seen here and the incision is marked. From the previously marked angle, the incision extends along the posterior axillary crease approximately 6 to 8 centimeters and provides access to the tendinous insertion of the latissimus. It is similarly extended 12 to 14 centimeters distally, just posterior to the anterior border of the latissimus muscle. An attempt is made to keep the incision slightly posterior to avoid wound maceration when the arm is abducted postoperatively. Once it is identified, as seen here, the anterior border is freed along its entirety. Retractors are used to facilitate this process. Along its proximal extent, the long, thin tendon of the latissimus can be identified and freed from the encompassing tissues. The tendon can then be freed from the more posterior and underlying teres major muscle belly. Because this muscular interval can be indistinct, Identification of the thin tendinous portion proximally provides an excellent interval to begin isolation of the latissimus, teres major more posteriorly, latissimus with its tendinous proximal expansion anteriorly, and the exposed muscular interval demonstrated by the scissors. Next, this interval is defined between the two muscles along the course of the latissimus dorsi. It is critical to free the latissimus to its neurovascular bundle to provide maximal excursion of the transferred muscle. Sponge sticks are often helpful to bluntly open this intermuscular interval. A pinrose drain is passed to isolate the latissimus once it is completely freed proximally. The pinrose drain is used to tension the humeral insertion of the latissimus dorsi. It is carefully transected, being careful to avoid injury to the radial nerve. Once it is freed proximally, the distal muscle belly is released to the level of the neurovascular pedicle. This pedicle is visualized here. The latissimus is held along its future course to determine its length respective to the greater tuberosity insertion site. Because the latissimus tendon is quite thin, we routinely use an Achilles allograft as augmentation in an effort to provide a more robust tissue for humeral reattachment. Initially, several large non-absorbable sutures are placed along each edge of the allograft and passing through the central tendon to tubularize the allograft circumferentially around the latissimus dorsi tendon. This is completed in an interrupted fashion and typically three to four stitches are necessary. Next, a large non-absorbable suture is run in a locking fashion along each border of the tendon and allograft as demonstrated here. Once run circumferentially, it is tied along its proximal extent. Traction and passing stitches are placed distally. Finally, an absorbable epitendinous stitch is placed proximally to smooth the allograft tendon transition in an effort to facilitate smooth gliding of the tendon transfer. Long clamps are used to establish space for latissimus dorsi passage and to pass a passing stitch. The passing stitches attached to the distal portion of the allograft are then passed from the posterior to anterior wound, deep to the posterior deltoid, and superficial to the teres minor. 5 to 6, 5.5 mm double loaded suture anchors are placed as the medial and lateral row of anchors, spaced to cover the extent of the prepared greater tuberosity footprint. The arm is positioned in slight flexion, external rotation, and abduction, and the graft is appropriately tensioned. The stitches are passed from each anchor sequentially in a horizontal mattress fashion. These are then sequentially tied from anterior to posterior. The excess allograft is removed and the interval between the subscapularis and allograft is closed using interrupted figure of eight stitches using large non-absorbable suture. The final construct is seen here. Our standard rehabilitation protocol includes an abduction brace for a minimum of six weeks. This is utilized to avoid prolonged or increased tension on the repair during the acute healing period. Passive range of motion typically begins at two weeks, with only general pendulum-type exercises being performed prior to this. 
Strengthening is avoided for the first 10 to 12 weeks, and as other authors have also noted, our experience is that biofeedback is critically important to learning how to appropriately utilize the transferred muscle for its new function. The same patient is seen here three months postoperatively. The initial postoperative management focused on transfer protection and regaining shoulder motion. As demonstrated here, he has regained his full active preoperative forward flexion, abduction, external rotation, and no longer requires assistance to accomplish full abduction secondary to an improved ability to prevent early humeral impingement with the acromion. Subjectively, pain with these motions is also significantly improved. As would be expected at three months postoperatively, he remains weak with abduction and forward flexion. The next six to eight weeks of therapy is focused on biofeedback training and strength improvements. Clinically, outcomes reported following this procedure are relatively good considering it is used largely as a salvage procedure for many patients. Warner and Parsons reported a 73% overall patient satisfaction rate in conjunction with a 27% re-rupture rate. The authors also noted outcomes were significantly worse when utilized as a salvage procedure for a failed rotator cuff tear as compared to a primary procedure. We have begun using allograft augmentation in an effort to minimize tendon re-rupture. Similarly, Birmingham and colleagues reported an ASES score improvement from 43 to 61 points in 18 patients at 25-month follow-up. Ionati has also reported similar results and noted that females and those with poor initial shoulder function were at higher risk for a less optimal surgical outcome. Finally, in appropriately selected patients, the latissimus dorsi transfer is capable of providing improved shoulder function and decreased shoulder discomfort. Thank you.